When you think about fall, what kind of picture do you paint in your mind? Leaves changing color and falling from the trees, maybe trips to the pumpkin patch and sipping apple cider, cinnamon scented pine cones possibly? If so, that's cool. You know what I picture though? Relaxing on the couch, wrapped up in a warm blanket, fire burning in the fireplace as I sip a nice warm cup of cocoa while watching a nice mystery unfold in front of my very eyes on the TV. Sadly, my chimney is literally broken, and I run warm naturally, so I prefer not to be wrapped up in a blanket, and my couch is extremely uncomfortable. But I'm just trying to paint a mental picture for you, the viewer. By the way, thank you very much for clicking on this video, I truly appreciate you being here. Back to fall though. In my professional opinion, November is the peak of fall. November is the crown jewel of fall. Like, yeah, September is okay, October is really amazing because of spooky season, but November really is the epitome of all things that make fall season amazing. And you might be thinking, why is he talking about November? Because it's already December. Well, at the time of me recording this, it is still November, so please allow me to live in the moment for a second here. I have many great childhood memories from the fall season. One of my favorite family traditions growing up was setting up our Christmas tree and decorating it while we had a nice warm fire going in the fireplace with some Christmas music going in the background. Then a week or two later, we would have Thanksgiving dinner with my family and spend time together around the tree watching shows after dinner was done. All in all, I'd say that fall really is the feel good time of year. And you know what really accompanies that feel good feeling in my opinion? A nice mystery. There's just something magical about the combination of enjoying the feel good season to the full extent while trying to wrap your brain around a good mystery. The two go hand in hand perfectly in my opinion. And when I think about the perfect show that meets right in the middle of that feel good feeling and mysterious wonder, the first show that comes to mind without a doubt has to be Scooby Doo. Scooby-Doo is a show that I have to assume everybody knows by this point, right? The show has been a massive hit since 1969. We've seen many Scooby-Doo spin-offs, made-for-TV movies, and even movies made for the big screen. Mystery Incorporated has been solving mysteries and entertaining us for over 50 years now. Those meddling kids won the hearts of millions with the original release of Scooby-Doo Where Are You and have continued to entertain for generations to come. However, there is one unsolved mystery that I've been debating with my friends ever since I was a child, and that would be which made-for-TV Scooby-Doo movie was the best one. There were some notable ones from back in the day that were truly iconic. Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders comes to mind, or Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, or even Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School. All classics, but in my opinion, none of them can touch the best Scooby-Doo movie. However, that brings me to the mystery at hand. What is the best Scooby-Doo movie? There are two that come to mind, and I truly can't figure out which one is the best. I've debated this with many people for many years, and we can never come to a true agreement and crown one true champion. And that's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're gonna take a look at the two best Scooby-Doo movies, and you're gonna put on your mystery solving hat to help me get to the bottom of this once and for all. Together, you and I are going to compare and contrast the two movies to finally solve this mystery once and for all. And we're gonna start off with a truly strong contender for the crown. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. This movie came out in 1998, and I own it on VHS. I still have the original copy I used to watch on repeat when I was a little kid. I may be biased based on that fact, but I'm gonna do my best to maintain a neutral position in this comparison. The movie begins on a dark and stormy night, at a castle in an unknown location. The dark stone halls of the castle seemingly barren, that is, until we see a pair of spooky green arms rip a wooden door to shreds, and behind that door, we see those meddling kids and their dog cowering in fear. <laughs> We're treated to a classic Scooby-Doo chase sequence that, as per usual, is resolved by some sort of hijinks.
As you'd expect, the culprit was a bad guy in a mask who was, in some way or another, probably tied to the story. And I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that big dog and you meddling kids! <laughs> We fast forward an unknown amount of time to see Daphne telling the story on a talk show. We learn that she became a reporter and is now host of a successful show called Coast to Coast with Daphne Blake. She admits that she got out of the mystery solving business because in the end of every mystery, it always ended up being a guy in a mask behind it. Daphne admits that's why the crew went their separate ways, except for her and Fred, who is the producer and one-man crew behind her show. We also learn that Daphne is starting a new segment on her show where they investigate real haunted houses. Sort of a ghost to ghost with Daphne Blake. <laughs> right, but this time I intend to find some real haunted houses for my viewers. Gee, it's too bad the rest of the old gang won't be along for the ride. Yeah, I really miss them. We then get a glimpse at the rest of the gang. Shaggy and Scooby are working at the airport, sniffing out contraband food from other countries. Unfortunately, their boss is a massive jerk, and they get fired for eating all of the contraband. Looking back at this as an adult now, I can't help but imagine how different this movie would have turned out if Scooby was sniffing for drugs instead of food. Buffalo Soldier in the heart of America! Meanwhile, Velma owns and runs a bookshop that specializes in mystery novels, which you'd imagine her enjoying, but she just seems to be very miserable at this job. Freddy gives the old gang a call and convinces them to come along with him and Daphne as they explore some real haunted houses. Well then... Surprise! Happy birthday, Daphne! <laughs> Fred rips the Coast to Coast with Daphne Blake logo off of the van, and they head out to one of the most notoriously haunted places in the United States, Louisiana. One thing that gives this movie bonus points in my book is the soundtrack. When I saw this movie as a kid, I loved the music. We get our first taste of the soundtrack in this montage. <laughs> Daphne feels frustrated that just like in the good old days, all of the ghosts and monsters are always bad guys in masks. A woman named Lena overhears them talking and invites them to the house that she works at on Moonscar Island. She claims that the house is haunted by a pirate named Morgan Moonscar who died on the island. And that Lena is kind of cute. Fred! I just meant she'd be real photogenic for our segment. Mm. Right. Uh, wipe your upper lip, Romeo. Jinkies, listen to this. I gotta say, seeing Fred munching on beignets in this scene always made me want to try them. That's another thing that gives this movie bonus points that you'll see more of later on. The southern cuisine that appears throughout this movie really makes me want to go on a food tour of Louisiana. I've made a lot of poor boy sandwiches in my time, but this is going to be the biggest of them all. Like we're used to eating big meals. Like, hey buddy, don't hog all the hot sauce. I see you boys like it hot. Like mo hotter, mo better, eh, Scoob? Mo hotter, mo better. They end up following Lena to a ferry that's run by a guy named Jacques, who's kind of menacing, but he's an interesting character. While on the ferry, Scooby and Shaggy fall off of the boat while Scooby's trying to get a huge catfish named Big Mona. They get chased by gators, but they're saved by a big, derpy-looking fisherman named Snakebite, who's pissed at them because he hates tourists, and they scared off Big Mona, who's been trying to catch forever. Now all your splash and chase Big Mona away. Oh, quit you grumbling, Snakebite! You ain't never caught that fish and you ain't never gonna did! Snakebite also has this big old hunting pig named Mojo who is also a massive asshole just like his owner. The gang makes it to the island and when they arrive at the house, which is on a pepper plantation, they find it crawling with cats. Well, Lena wasn't kidding, this place is crawling with cats. What? What? We get our first glimpse at the gardener, Bo, who gets pissed at Scooby for ruining a bunch of his work in the chase, and we meet the owner of the property, Ms. Lenoir, who hates dogs and seems annoyed that Lena brought the gang here to see her haunted house that's been in her family for generations. So, Miss Lenoir, is your house really haunted? Yes, it is an old house with restless spirits. 
The gang goes in for a tour, and naturally, Shaggy and Scooby go straight for the kitchen for some grub. They're snacking on some gumbo and extremely hot peppers that look delicious, by the way, when they feel a chill and we get our first look at some paranormal activity. You can feel the chill in the air. Cut! Who opened a window? After that, Velma starts levitating out of nowhere. Fred is skeptical, but Velma reassures him that there are no wires or magnets anywhere. Later, they're reviewing footage, and Freddy uses his camera settings to enhance the image, where we see the ghost of Morgan Moonscar in the background. Velma goes back to the kitchen to investigate further, and straight up destroys the kitchen with a spatula. We learn that Maelstrom was the name of Morgan Moonscar's pirate ship, and pieces of it were used in the construction of this house. Also, his treasure is supposedly buried on the island somewhere. Meanwhile, Shaggy and Scooby are enjoying a picnic when Scooby goes off to chase some cats again. One thing leads to another, and Shaggy and Scooby end up being chased by Snakebite's pig, Mojo, and they fall into a gigantic hole in the ground. Zoinks! How humiliating! Chased into a hole by one-third of a BLT! <laughs> While trying to climb out of the hole, Shaggy unearths some skeletal remains. A ghostly mist appears and reanimates the remains into the zombified corpse of Morgan Moonscar. They climb out of the hole, being chased by the zombie, and then they bump into Bo, the gardener. The rest of the gang shows up, and Shaggy takes them back to the hole that they fell into, and everyone is immediately suspicious of Bo, considering he's the first one that they saw after it happened. And he's the one who dug the massive hole to begin with. Hmm, what are you planting, elephants? That hole is huge! It starts getting late, and Ms. Lenoir convinces the gang to stay for the night at the house. Lena shows everyone to their rooms, and we learn that it just so happens that the harvest moon is tonight. Shaggy and Scooby are getting ready for dinner when they're confronted by a Civil War era spirit. Boy, do I need a trim. Like, much better. Get away. Like, who's that? Velma does some investigating to find out that the mirror they saw the ghost in belonged to a Civil War soldier whose barracks were on the island. Later, while everyone is having gumbo at the table, Scooby gets kicked out for trying to fight the cats, so him and Shaggy enjoy a specially prepared crawfish boil in the back of the mystery machine. Crawfish? <laughs> These crawfish sure are tasty! This scene always made me want to try crawdads, and I have literally never liked seafood. I'm telling you, there's just something about the southern cuisine in this movie. It gets me every time. Cats end up swarming the mystery machine while they're trying to eat, so Scooby and Shaggy drive off to eat in privacy somewhere else on the island. They're finishing their meal when they decide to each eat a ridiculously spicy Moonscar Island pepper, which leads to them sprinting out of the car and drinking out of a disgusting nearby pond. Just then, the ghostly green mist appears, and we find out that they were drinking out of a pond full of dead bodies that are now being reanimated as zombies. They run off after getting the mystery machine stuck in mud, and yet again they run into Bo, the gardener, who is mysteriously walking around in the middle of the night. Back at the house, the gang hears the commotion coming from outside, and they go out to investigate. They run into Bo outside, who tells them that Shaggy and Scooby are running around and yelling about zombies, but he didn't see anything. They split up into two groups. Fred goes with Daphne, and Velma goes with Bo. Fred and Daphne end up finding the mystery machine, and while they're searching it, a zombie shows up, as well as Shaggy and Scooby. It's the gardener! No! It's the fisherman! No! It's the ferryman! Oh! Maybe it's... real! They come to the realization that the zombies are real, and just then, the ghastly green mist appears again and reanimates a bunch of corpses that come chasing after the group. Sadly, Freddy trips and the camera lands sinking into quicksand, never to be recovered. But hey, on the bright side, we get a chase montage with possibly the best song in the movie. You hear the beating of your heart, you know the scream is gonna start. Just 
So, fun fact that I am about to go on a complete mini rant over, that song and the other song from the beginning of the movie were performed by a band from LA called Sky Cycle. They're mostly known for their contributions to this movie, but they also were tragically screwed over by their record label. They wrote an entire album and the record label gave them a hard time about it, requesting that they re-record multiple songs and requesting the band postpone the release of the album until the Christmas season on the belief that it was, quote, better for established artists. The band believed that the increasing popularity of the internet made the idea of releasing the album in an mp3 format great for promotional purposes, which their record label also disagreed disagreed with. They released a few of the songs as free mp3 downloads on their website, which angered the label who believed releasing the album as mp3 in the first place was completely unacceptable. The frontman of the band even went as far as testifying in the big Napster lawsuit from 2000, citing how they and many other bands are treated by major record labels and showing his support for websites like Napster that were letting people share and download music files online without having to pay for the album they were listening to. In the end, the record label dropped them and and didn't release their album. So they just made the album available as a free download on their website, showing their support for free trading of music as a promotional activity. Also, fuck Metallica, they suck. Rant over. At the end of the chase sequence, Shaggy and Scooby fall into this cave-like hole and find an altar with voodoo dolls that look like Velma, Daphne, and Fred. Ow! Hey! It's not my fault! Something's controlling me! Bo, get us down! <laughs> I can't. Jenkins, sorry. They're chased out of the cave by a bunch of bats and are surrounded by zombies. Oddly enough though, if you hadn't noticed, no one has been attacked by these zombies. They're just kind of there and walking towards Shaggy and Scooby. Back at the house, everyone is looking for Ms. Lenoir and Lena, who they heard screaming. Fred ends up stumbling into a hidden tunnel under the stairs to find Lena. Lena explains that the tunnel was built during the Civil War to hide from enemy soldiers and that Ms. Lenoir was taking her down there to hide from the zombies when the zombies grabbed her and dragged her down the tunnel. You say the zombies dragged Simone away? Yes! It was horrible! Don't worry, we'll find her and it's gonna be okay. They follow the tunnel until they get to this ritualistic altar and that's when Velma decides to confront Lena. She says that she knows Ms. Lenoir wasn't dragged down the tunnel because the footprints from her heels indicate that she walked down instead. All of a sudden, Ms. Lenoir appears, turning the crank of a pulley that opens a shaft to the light of the full moon on the ritual moon dial in the room. Then, Lena and Ms. Lenoir use the voodoo dolls we saw earlier to slam the gang against the wall and tie them up, leaving them helpless. Uh, you won't get away with this! I've been getting away with it for 200 years. <laughs> After they both transform into Khajiit-like cat people, they reveal that every Harvest Moon, they must drain the life from people lured onto the island to maintain their immortality, and the gang is their latest victims. Thankfully, Shaggy and Scooby are still free and running through the bayou. They come across Jacques and his fairy, misguidedly hoping for him to be their saving grace. I am happy to see y'all. <laughs> Back at the ritual site, Ms. Lenoir explains that all of this started because of Morgan Moonscar. Lena and Ms. Lenoir were part of the original group of settlers on the island 200 years ago and they worshipped a cat god. When Morgan and his gang of pirates showed up, they attacked the settlers and forced them into the gator infested bayou. Only Lena and Ms. Lenoir survived. They prayed to their cat god to put a curse on Morgan and his pirates, and that's when the cat god answered by turning them into cat people and they quickly laid waste to the Moonscar pirates. Over the years, more boats came to the island. One was full of spice traders who started the pepper plantation and built the house. Then, on the night of the harvest moon, Lena and Ms. Lenoir turned into cat people and murdered them all, seizing control of the house and plantation that had been built. We also learned that the zombies were not trying to hurt anyone. They were trying to warn them so that the gang doesn't face the same gruesome fate that they all did. We cut back to Shaggy and Scooby, who were caught by Jacques. Come on, Scoob! Now's our chance! Shaggy and Scooby trip and fall down into the ritual chamber, knocking over the cat people right before they can drain the life from the rest of the gang. <laughs> Having
Having reached their ultimate form, the cat people catch Shaggy and Scooby, and right as they're about to attack, the zombies show up to save the day. Shaggy! The zombies are the good guys! Like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Velma gets a hold of her voodoo doll and gets the rope off of it, setting herself free. She unties the ropes off the rest of the gang's dolls, and she comes across a piece of Lena's and Ms. Lenoir's clothes that ripped off in their transformation. They use the pieces of clothes on the dolls to make them resemble Lena and Ms. Lenoir, which gives them the ability to use the voodoo magic to slam them against the wall. Right on time, too, because they had just caught Shaggy and Scooby and were starting to drain the life from them. When Jacques shows up again to help the cat people, things start to look pretty grim as they all end up cornered and the voodoo dolls knocked out of their hands. But just then, the clock passes midnight and the cat people start to burn because they hadn't drained the life force out of anyone in time. With their souls having Having been avenged, the zombies are finally able to rest in peace as they all turn back into piles of bones. Thank you. Daphne is really bummed out that the camera got lost in quicksand so no one will believe their story of what happened. Velma also notes that the police probably won't believe this story either, but that's when Bo chimes up and reveals that he is actually a detective who's been looking for evidence regarding the disappearances that have been happening on the island over the years. With peace having been restored, the movie ends with the gang loading up into the ferry to leave the island while Scooby is picking a basket of peppers for the road. He almost doesn't make it in time. As Scooby crash lands into the window of the mystery machine, Shaggy walks up and hands him a sandwich, thankful that they can finally have a nice and peaceful quiet meal. As for the credits, they jump right into the song Terror Time by our boys in Sky Cycle. Gotta love it. All in all, this movie is absolutely fantastic in my opinion. I loved it as a kid and I absolutely enjoyed it just as much now as an adult. There's a fantastic story in a creepy setting and for once the gang was facing actual ghosts and monsters. We also get a post credit scene of Scooby-Doo pouring some milk for the cats, kind of like the post credit scenes from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but a lot less epic. Considering the nostalgia factor, the vibe of the movie, the soundtrack, and the story structure, I'd give this movie a solid 8.5 out of 10. It's genuinely good in all aspects, in my opinion. Rotten Tomatoes gave the movie 88% on the tomato meter, and the audience score is at 78%, which I feel is relatively fair, but Rotten Tomatoes can be hit or miss, so take that for what you will, and let's move on to the next movie. Uncle Scooby? <laughs> Hi! I'm Scrappy-Doo! Scrappy-Doo? <laughs> the next one is a movie that I really feel mixed emotions about. When Zombie Island came out in September of 1998, I was four years old and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. I was really into Scooby-Doo at the time and the movie had a really big kid kind of feeling to it that made four-year-old me feel cool for watching it. This next movie came out in October of 2001. By that time, I was seven years old and I don't want to say I had grown out of enjoying Scooby-Doo, but I just felt like after Zombie Island, Island, the quality of the Scooby-Doo releases started to dip and they weren't able to keep my attention as much. So at the time that it was released, I didn't really have any interest in watching it. Eventually, I think maybe a year or two later, I ended up watching it and enjoying it and I was surprised at how much I actually liked it. Of course, I'm talking about none other than Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. What drew me into this movie wasn't the cover or the villain or the plot. I actually wasn't interested in this movie until one day when my parents took me to Blockbuster and I ended up renting a copy of Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase the video game for PlayStation. I played that game having never seen the movie and I really enjoyed it, which pushed me to finally give the movie a chance and I'm glad that I did. But does the movie still hold up 20 years later? I guess we're gonna have to find out. The movie begins with an old scientist working in a lab, pondering. He goes walking through the lab and finds two younger scientists working on a computer program. Any progress, Eric? I'm sorry, Professor Kaufman. There's still something wrong with the program. 
Seemingly out of nowhere, a futuristic looking laser nearby powers on and fires a shot into the room, and that's when we first meet the villain known as the Phantom Virus. The virus approaches the scientists, and as he does, he sucks up all of their computer data from their consoles, which oddly enough is a visual process of binary code flying off of the screens and into the monster. We learn that the virus basically has the ability to control electronics. <laughs> <laughs> we then cut to the gang, rolling in the mystery machine on their way to visit their old friend Eric at his college. Shaggy is in the back of the van playing a video game and he is stoked to finally get there so he can try out the new video game that Eric is designing. Personally, I had no idea that Shaggy was a gamer, but hey, character development, I guess. When we get there, we get to play the computer game Eric designed. I bet it's way cooler than this one. Well, cooler. Turns out Eric designed a video game starring Scooby and the gang as they solve mysteries. They finally make it to the college that's just called State University. No specific state, just State University. They're walking on the campus when they get confronted by a very rude security guard who claims to run the campus. I've been here for 20 years and there's never been any trouble on my watch. I am the head of security. Wembley is the name. <laughs> One big complaint I have about this movie right out the gate is the animation style. This is the fourth Scooby-Doo direct-to-video movie, the first one having been Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. You can tell that they were trying to keep the same look and feel for the animation of specifically The Gang, which is cool, but this is also the first Scooby-Doo release to be produced in high-definition format. On that note, I feel like this look and feel was captured a lot better in Zombie Island with the old-school animation than it was here. I'm keeping a special eye on you, pooch. Pooch? Like Scooby's just playing, officer. Well, what are we? After talking with the security guard, the gang catches up with Eric, who shows them around his lab. In this scene, we meet Eric's lab partner, Bill, and old Professor Kaufman. Eric starts to explain why he invited the gang to visit. We find out that the futuristic laser from the beginning is a device they've been using to transport real-world objects into their video games that they're developing. Jinkies! You mean you can transport objects from the real world into the computer world? Precisely, young lady. That's fantastic! Eric tells them about how the laser beamed a monster virus into their lab last night. Professor Kaufman explains that society nowadays is so reliant on technology that having this phantom virus going around and manipulating technology is a threat to the entire world. We also learn a little more about Eric's game, which has the same name as the movie, and stars Mystery Inc. solving mysteries and escaping monsters to collect a box of Scooby snacks on each level. Meanwhile, lab partner Bill shows off his baseball video game that he's working on, which no one really seems interested in except for Fred. Their goal with this laser is to win the quarter of a million dollar grand prize at the International Science Convention this year. They tell the gang all about how the virus came out of the video game and brought a phone to life to attack Eric. Then I held up a magnetic bar in the face. It seemed to have an adverse effect on the virus. Yeah, and it seemed like the magnet weakened him, like kryptonite Superman. The goal is to have the gang lure out the phantom virus so Eric can use the laser to zap him back into the game, so Professor Kaufman arms them with some heavy-duty magnets and they go off in search of the virus. The gang splits up, as they usually do, and Daphne, Fred, and Velma go down into the basement to investigate. Some of this old junk could be very valuable. <laughs> Jinkies! It's him! This monster is seemingly made from electricity and literally doesn't have a nose, but somehow he sneezes from dust coming from a book. They use the magnets to ward off the virus. Get back, you creepy thingy! Creepy thingy? Psst, you'll pay for this! We don't think so. Thingy! 
The virus runs off as they chase it. They end up losing track of the virus, but they do run into the security guard from before who gets suspicious of the gang and decides that he's taking them back to Professor Kaufman's lab. Meanwhile, Shaggy and Scooby are in the dining hall of the college, offending everyone with their eating habits. Their table is covered with burgers, french fries, pizza, and Shaggy even has a hot dog with whipped cream on it. The food in this movie can't even come close to Zombie Island. Just saying. Shaggy and Scooby eat until the cafeteria runs out of food, and then they get approached by the phantom virus. I think I saw a vending machine down the hall. What is it, Scoob? Oh, hello, Mr. Phantom. Shaggy and Scooby run away, looking like they're both nine months pregnant. We get treated to another chase montage with some music, but I gotta admit, as much as I'm trying to be neutral in my analysis, the music in this movie blows in comparison to Zombie Island. Shaggy and Scooby run back to the lab, being chased by the virus. As the whole gang runs through the lab chasing after the virus, they eventually crash into each other and while they're distracted, an unknown person presses the button on the laser and sends them into the video game. The scientists all show up to find out what had happened, and they explain that while they're in the game, the danger they face is real. So, throw a switch or something and get them out! The game doesn't work that way. They'll have to play through all the levels to get out. You're kidding me. I wish he was. Okay, this makes absolutely no sense. Not even 15 minutes ago, we watched this guy use the laser to send a box of Scooby Snacks into the game and then take it back out a few minutes later so that Shaggy and Scooby could eat it. The box of Scooby Snacks didn't have to complete all the levels to get taken out of the game, but for some reason actual people zapped into the game can't get out without beating all the levels? And how do they even know that? It's not like they've actually zapped any real people into the game before. This plot hole is just killing me. But regardless, this is where the movie starts actually getting pretty good in my opinion. The first level takes place on the moon, and Shaggy quickly realizes that they can actually get hurt in the game while he's horsing around. Even worse, the phantom virus also got zapped back into the game, and he's there to torment them. He's not alone! Let's play ball! They get chased by the phantom virus and his goons, but thankfully, since this is level 1, the box of Scooby Snacks is in a very obvious place. Scooby narrowly escapes the clutches of the goons and snags the box, transporting them to level 2. This next level takes place in the Roman Colosseum, which is eerily empty. Hey, what's this? What are these white lines for? Like it's chalk! Yikes! The gang finds themselves facing a team of skeleton gladiators and a giant lion that's carrying a box of Scooby Snacks in its mouth. The lion sets the box down as they all attack the gang. Fred gets the idea to use Daphne's purple jacket to play matador with the lion. Leo! Leo! Okay. They trick the lion back into its pen and close the doors. Shaggy and Scooby distract the gladiators while Fred grabs the box of Scooby Snacks. And just like that, piece of cake, they are on to level 3, which takes place in a Stone Age jungle filled with dinosaurs. <laughs> The gang runs off into some trees and escapes where the T-Rex can't fit, and they hike a few miles until they find themselves in a cave. They find an ancient cave painting of a volcano, which they take as a hint of where the box of Scooby Snacks could be. And of course, when they get to that volcano, it starts erupting. They notice a baby pterodactyl with its wing caught underneath a boulder on the side of the mountain, and right after that, the phantom virus shows up on T-Rex back yet again. They climb the mountain, and Scooby makes the bold decision to bolt after the baby pterodactyl to save it. He makes quick work of the boulder just like Chris Redfield in Resident Evil 5, and luckily he finds the box of Scooby Snacks up there with the pterodactyl just in time for the lava to flow down too. The gang gets teleported into level 4 which takes place underwater, and we jump right into a montage with more music. <laughs> It's almost like the music just keeps getting progressively worse. They montage their way through a few levels. First they get the box of Scooby Snacks in level 4 from a treasure chest. Then they go to level 5 where they seem to be the size of ants in someone's backyard. 
We don't even get to see how they get the box of Scooby Snacks before they're transported to level 6, which seems to take place in Japan and sees Daphne scaring the hell out of a samurai with her impressive bow staff skills. They go to level 7 that takes place in Egypt near the pyramids. I'd love to tell you guys where they found the Scooby Snacks, but we aren't even given that info, sadly. In level 8, they go to the medieval times where Shaggy faces a fierce fire-breathing dragon and saves a princess who has the box of Scooby Snacks. In level 9, they find themselves at the North Pole, where they simply have to scale the pole to find the box of Scooby Snacks. All of this happens during that short montage, by the way, so that's why it seems like I'm breezing through all of this like it barely happened. Finally, they reach what is clearly the best level in the game, level 10, which Eric explains is so hard that he himself, the creator of the game, has never beaten it. At first, they think that they're finally home, but then they see the sky render and realize that they're still in the video game and that the last level takes place in their hometown. They approach a little old lady on the street corner to see if she knows anything about where the box of Scooby Snacks is. Excuse us, ma'am. We were wondering. Surprise! <laughs> the virus! Welcome to the final level. You're in the major leagues now. The gang runs off to a nearby malt shop where they meet some familiar faces. You're the characters in Eric's video game. And you're from the real world. Jeez. Jeez. Did I really wear that years ago? That jacket with that skirt? Hmm. Huh. Nice ascot. <laughs> Works for me. Their meeting is cut short by the arrival of the phantom virus, and they all run out of the back of the malt shop and go on a ride in the old school mystery machine. We learn that the video game versions of the gang just kind of hang out in level 10. They know exactly where the Scooby Snacks are, but they don't have a reason to find them because if they do, they'll just get sent back to level 1, and they actually like it in level 10. All was well until the new gang showed up and brought the phantom virus with them. So the two gangs decide to team up to claim the Scooby Snacks and defeat the virus once and for all. The video game gang Gang takes our gang right to the Cyberland boardwalk to find the Scooby Snacks. They find the phantom virus there hitting balls in the batting cages, and they make a break for the video arcade. On the way, they're stopped by some classic familiar faces, such as the Creeper, Jaguaro, the Tar Monster, and Gator Ghoul. They run towards the beach where they find old Iron Face coming to get them. When they first met these monsters in the original episodes, they quickly find out that they were all bad guys in masks, but in the video game world, they are all real and pose a very real threat to the gang. <laughs> <laughs> Tough time with the mask, guys. Please wheel. <laughs> A series of ridiculous hijinks and chase scenes follow, while each of the gang individually, along with their video game counterpart, are chased by a different monster. There wasn't much of note going on in these scenes that support the story, and they were more just kind of filler content than anything, so I'll advise you that they happen, but we're not going to go into much detail. They pushed the filler content so far that the same chases that already happened, happened a second time, with each individual pairing of members getting chased by the same exact monster as before, just under different circumstances. Again, just as unnoteworthy as they were the first time. After the obnoxious double double chase scenes, the whole group meets back up. Shaggy realizes that he still has one of the intense magnets with him, and it makes the video game versions of themselves wig out just like it did to the virus earlier. The Cyber Gang is made of electromagnetic energy, and therefore affected by the magnet, just like the Phantom Virus. What's this about a magnet? They realize they can use it against the virus, and they all head for the arcade where the Scooby Snacks are located so they can face him. They head in, and when they are confronted by the phantom virus, he uses his ability to manipulate electronics to basically make the arcade machines attack them. Fred approaches him with the magnet while Scooby goes for the Scooby Snacks. Hey, Mr. Zappy! <laughs> Fred slips on a ball like an idiot and drops the magnet, leaving the virus available to attack, which he does with full force. If you thought my hitting was good, wait till you see my pitching! <laughs> The video game gang, who stayed behind because the magnet hurts them, sees that the gang needs help, but when they decide to step in, they get attacked by the other monsters. Video game Scooby bravely enters the arcade by himself, and he hatches a plan with Fred. He ends up distracting the phantom virus, while the real Scooby goes for the snacks, which works like a charm. <laughs> You did it! 
It's not really explained why, but for some reason the act of the gang beating the final level completely destroys the phantom virus, and he basically disintegrates into nothing. With the virus defeated and all levels having been beaten, they say farewell to the video game gang as they get teleported back to the real world. The gang ends up talking to the scientists and security guard and explaining all of the clues that they found. The phantom virus shouted, play ball! And on the Colosseum level, we found some chalk lines like a large diamond. But our biggest clue was on the final level. When the phantom virus appeared in a batting cage. All I'm getting is that the virus had a thing for baseball. Bill, not so fast, kid. We learned that lab partner Bill created the virus because he was jealous of Eric. Bill had been there for two years longer than Eric was, but his video game wasn't chosen for the project, so he was really salty. He figured that if he could scare Eric away with the virus, then he could use his game for the project and keep the prize money from the science fair for himself. He was afraid of the gang finding out who created the virus, so he was the one that used the laser to zap them into the game. The prize would have been all mine if it wasn't for... Us meddling kids! <laughs> <laughs> the movie ends with all of the gang at the malt shop with Eric enjoying some lunch as Eric pulls up his laptop to let Shaggy try out the video game for himself. Zoinks! Look! What are you doing, Scoob? <laughs> now that's what I call hacking. Hacking! And Scooby snacking. Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> <laughs> the credits roll, and a few minutes later, we end up getting a post credit scene that's actually like four minutes long, and it's kind of a third wall break. Each member of the gang takes a turn telling which scene of the movie was their favorite to record. Velma liked the prehistoric scenes, Fred liked the Roman Colosseum scenes. Daphne liked the North Pole scenes, Shaggy liked the recording at the arcade. What was your favorite part of Scooby-Doo in the cyber chase? The racer. Like I got it. Fire away, Scoob. It's amazing what you can find on the web, eh, Scoob? Now, looking back at what I just recorded, I feel like I may have been a little too harsh on Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase during my analysis. There were a few points where I kinda ragged on it, but in all reality, it is a genuinely great Scooby-Doo film. The story wasn't too bad, and the villain was kind of interesting, but the animation style was kind of iffy, the soundtrack was just meh, some of the lines were really cheesy, and there was quite a bit of filler content. However, I really feel that way after having just freshly watched Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. I think that maybe I would have been a little less critical if I wasn't comparing it to another movie, but hey, it is what it is. All in all, I'd give this movie a solid 6.5 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 60% on the tomato meter and a 65% audience score, which I feel might be just a little harsh, but again, Rotten Tomatoes can be hit or miss, so do with that info what you will. By no means am I saying this movie was bad. I enjoyed enjoyed it, and I still do, but I'd straight up be lying to you if I said I didn't enjoy Zombie Island more. One of the biggest things that drew me into Cyber Chase is the video game aspect of it. As someone who's always enjoyed video games, I have a heightened sense of enjoyment for this movie because it is about a video game. However, I will say Zombie Island drew me in just by being an overall good movie that almost put more of a serious spin on Scooby-Doo. When I really boil it down to the facts on this debate, after a long pondering and thorough analysis, I really have to give the win to Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Between these two movies, it's clearly the winner, and I might go as far as saying that Zombie Island might be the greatest Scooby-Doo movie of all time. But what do you think? Have you seen both of these movies? Which one do you think is better? And is there maybe another Scooby-Doo movie that you enjoyed more than these two? Let me know in the comments down below, I always love seeing your guys' feedback. If you enjoyed this video, drop a like and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it recommends this video to everyone else, and of course, as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace.